Hotel is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. Godtel is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. Godtel is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. Godtel is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God tell. I'm going to ask you all some questions, getting a little personal. How many of you really want to obey God? Raise your hand. You want to obey God. How many of you smoke? How many of you believe that it's God's will for you to smoke? <laughs> if you don't believe it's God's will for you to smoke and you want to obey God, why are you doing it? Smoking won't send you to hell. But my God, it makes you smell like you've already been there. Yes, that's just me. That's just the truth. I have a hard time getting in a car with somebody that smokes. I used to smoke. I quit 47 years ago. I can remember exactly when I quit smoking. It was Easter Sunday, 47 years ago. After my wife, who is so lovely and nice, I came home from work and she said, how would you like to kiss an ashtray? Well, I thought about that and said, well, I wouldn't. She said, I've been kissing one for quite some time. I had a friend who got saved, Bobby Henderson. I'll never forget him, neat guy. And uh, he had been in prison. He'd been doing a lot of things. But then he became a Christian. And uh, he was sitting in a chair one day, and his little five-year-old daughter jumped up in his lap. He had quit drinking. He'd quit smoking. He'd, you know, all this junk. And the little girl looked up at him and said, Daddy? Is this how Christians smell? And he said it broke his heart that he'd been putting his daughter through all that nasty, stinky smell. Now, I do get people that come to me with various things. One girl told Nancy that she had to smoke. The doctors told her she had to smoke because she was allergic to oxygen. Another guy told me that he had an arrangement with God that he could smoke and drink. And I looked at him and I said, you know, the only arrangement you're going to have is you're going to end up in hell. Especially about the drinking, because God says that a drunkard will not enter into the kingdom of God. Now we're in Revelations 21. <laughs> and we'll be looking at new heaven and earth, and I hope to see some of you there. But I'm going to tell you a secret. If you know something is wrong to do and you do it, it could be smoking or anything, it is sin. And it's really hard to get saved when you're disobeying God. Starting in uh, Revelations 21, the new heaven and the new earth. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and he will, they will be his people, and he will be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. 
He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, unbelieving, and abominable murderers and whoremongers, sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And a wall, great and high, and it had 12 gates and 12 angels, and the names written thereupon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates. On the north, south, west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lies four square. And the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and height are equal. And he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. And the building of the wall was of jasper, and the city was gold like unto clear glass. Foundations of the wall were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardinox, the sixth sardis, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth christophrase, the eleventh jasoneth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the streets of the city were pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there is no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no way enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's go back to verse 1. New heaven and new earth. The first heaven and first earth, he's talking about this planet. He's talking about our atmosphere. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heaven, singular, and the earth. A lot of the new translations have changed that to a plural word, which does not fit the context. Verse 8 says that God made the firmament and called the firmament heaven. And in verse 22, he said the birds, the fowls of the air, they fly in the firmament of the heaven. That's your context. He's talking about the atmosphere. Well, there's coming a day when God's going to burn everything up. Isn't that nice? Won't make the environmentalists very happy. They'll probably say, we can't do that, God. We got, we got laws. We got rules. God's going to say, yeah, watch this. Poof. And he's going to burn up everything that you see. Buildings, grass, dirt, everything. And he's going to start over. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief. That means when you least expect it. In which the heavens shall pass away. That's two heavens. The earth's atmosphere and outer space. With a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 
The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation? The word conversation there does not mean speech. It means the way you act and godliness. I was talking to an evolutionist one time and they believe in the Big Bang. They believe that all the mass of the universe was condensed into a, a ball the size of an electron and then when it couldn't compress anymore, it exploded out and poof, created everything by accident, time and chance. Everything from stars to sand at the beach, beach to people with PhDs. And they believe that. It's a religion. They won't admit that, but the human manifesto says that evolution is our religion. It's very plain. The Aislinists, they believe that stuff. And uh, I was talking to this guy and I said, you know, I know you all believe in the Big Bang theory that great heat and loud noises accompanied the creation or the evolution of the universe. He said, yeah, we believe that. I said, well, I believe in the Big Bang. He said, you do? So you agree with me? I said, not exactly. See, you believe that the Big Bang started at the beginning of creation. The Bible says the Big Bang is going to be at the end of this creation when God destroys everything. God is in the process right now of destroying everything, starting with our nation. He's already destroyed a bunch of nations over in the Middle East because they won't listen to him. And a lot of nations in Africa that once were Christian nations and are not anymore. And then we were once a Christian nation, we're not anymore. And God said that any nation that turns its back on him, he will destroy. Why do you think we're having so much trouble in Washington? You think it's because there's just bad people over there? There's crazy people over there, but they're not all that bad. They are a little nutty and they believe lies. In fact, they lie so much that we can't even send them to hell anymore. We just make heaven an auxiliary of hell. Those people, I've met politicians. I'll tell you what, some of them cannot find the truth of a fellow. On them. They're too busy telling lies and then they gotta tell another lie to cover up that lie. They do a lot of lying. And our news media has picked up on that. You can't believe hardly anything you hear on the news media anymore. They'll tell you lies. People tell you what they want to tell you or what they think you want to hear. And God's destroying our country. It's not man. He's using men. But it's God that's behind it all. I was in a store the other day and I said, I just can't wait for the computers to go down. They're going to go down. There's gonna come a day when they're all gonna crash. In fact, there's gonna come a day we may not even have electricity. We may not have anything. We're gonna be like going back to the Stone Age, I guess. It's gonna happen. God's word tells us it's gonna happen. And so she said, well, why do you want the computers to go down? I said, well, because before we had computers, things were pretty simple. I'd walk in the store, lay my money on the counter, pay for my items. You wrote out a little ticket, gave it to me. I was gone in five minutes. Now I go in there and you start asking me questions like, what's your phone number? So I want to, you know, I, I want to pay cash for that. I just want to pay for this. I don't need to give you my phone number. But they always ask you for phone numbers. You know, I go to Lowe's, they ask me for my phone number. I go to Tractor Supply, they want my phone number. Everybody wants my phone number. And they ain't cute girls. If they're cute girls, I might give them my phone number. Of course, my wife would answer the phone and kill me, but that's all right. We are going to be destroyed because we've kicked God out of everything. And God has finally had enough of it. <clears throat> so he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. I was talking to some Jehovah's Witnesses one day. And they said, Reverend Gentry, don't you know that the meek are going to inherit the earth? I said, sure, you can have it. I don't want it. You don't want it? I said, no. Well, what do you want? I said, I want what God promised me, a new heaven and a new earth. You think I want to stay here and clean up this mess? You can have it. While I was talking to him, it came up in the conversation that they didn't believe in hell. I said, that's great. You don't believe in hell? He said, no, we don't believe there's a hell. 
I said, what happens to you when you die if you don't accept your message? He said, you'll just be annihilated, but you get a second chance first. Well, where's that in the Bible? Well, it's not. That's what they believe. So I said, so if I don't join your group, what's going to happen to me? He said, well, you'll just be annihilated. I said, so there's no punishment. He said, no. I said, then I really don't have anything to lose, do I? He thought about it a minute and he said, well, I guess not. I said, but what if I'm right and there is a hell? And when I said that, his whole face changed because he saw. What I said was, if you do not receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, the real one, the God that created everything, you're going to die and go to hell. And he saw it and it scared him. Didn't make him stop doing what he was doing, but it's, it, you could tell he was, you know, visibly upset. I've talked to many different people from many different religions. And you know what's amazing about all the religions except for Christianity? They're all religions of works. You got to do stuff. You got to earn your way, place in heaven. I mean, the Muslims, they go out and blow themselves up thinking they're going to go straight to paradise. I feel sorry for them because they ain't going to go to paradise. They're very religious, but religion will kill you. Relationship with Christ, that's different. It's not a religion. There was, they all passed away. They were gone. No more sea. And John said, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. That would be out of the third heaven, God's place of residence, as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them. And God shall wipe away their tears. If you go back to chapter, I think it's 13, somewhere in there, he talks about it again. It says to wipe away all their tears. Here we are now in chapter 21, and he still hasn't done it. He's still going to wipe away their tears. You say, well, there won't be any tears in them. Well, there will at first. And I'll tell you why. Because to be saved, you receive Christ. It's a gift. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you can get into heaven with a full reward or no reward. Still get into heaven. But there's going to be a time when you're facing God when all of a sudden you're going to be very ashamed to be there. You'll be there, and that's better than the alternative, but you will be ashamed and probably shed some tears because of all the missed opportunities you had as a Christian. And we've missed a lot. That's why the best thing to do is try to see where you've sinned and make sure you're forgiven. Because God won't bring it back up if it's forgiven. But there's going to be a lot of people standing there recognizing that they've missed opportunities. Now, personally, I want to get there with a full reward. I don't know if that's going to happen because the rewards are not bent, uh, based on how much we do. It's based on whether we did what God told us to or not. That's why I mentioned smoking. It's a little thing. It won't send you to hell. But you will definitely be ashamed when you face God because you didn't get rid of that habit. Paul said he would not let anything have power over him. And those cigarettes have power over you. And the people that sell them to you, they're happy. And you know what I know for a fact? That most of the people that sell those things, especially the people in those big offices, you know, in Chicago and New York, the heads of those companies... They don't use them. They're smarter than that. They just want your money. I guarantee you, if you got lung cancer today and went to the hospital, the Marlboro people are not going to show up to tell you they're sorry and ask you if there's anything they can do for you. They won't care. All they will do is go out and look for the next sucker to buy some more. And when I quit smoking, cigarettes were 50 cents a pack. I was smart. Now they cost about $3 million a piece or something. I don't know. They're pretty darn expensive. And some of you don't have things that you could have because you wasted all your money burning it up. I walked over to the smoking deck in Nacogdoches one day and a guy said, uh, he didn't know me, and he said, you want a cigarette? I said, sure. 
He handed me a cigarette and I started grinding it up between my fingers, letting it fall on the ground. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm enjoying this cigarette. <laughs> he said, well, you're wasting it. I said, I'm not wasting it any more than you are. Another time I walked back there and I took a dollar bill out and rolled it up, put it in my mouth and lit it. What are you doing, Brother Gene? I'm smoking. Oh, you're just burning that money up. I said, that's what you're doing. What's the difference? I cut out the middleman and avoided lung cancer. <laughs> yeah. And I've had to bury people with cancers because of smoking. And it's not pretty. They die horrible deaths. And they were just like you. They thought it would never happen to them. And I've had to bury people that were in their 50s with tongue cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer. And people that drank who died in their 50s with cirrhosis of the liver. Oh, brothers, that'll never happen to me. Yeah, keep thinking that. And someday, if it happens to you, I hope your relatives, if you have any, will call me to do the funeral. I'll do it for free. But I'm going to tell them the truth. So you probably wouldn't want me to do your funeral. I've had to preach funerals from people that drank themselves to death. One guy was 26 years old. He got drunk, went home, got in his bed, and choked on his own vomit. People say, oh, but that doesn't happen very often. It happens a whole lot more than you think. It sure does. So oh, you're trying to scare people. If I could, I would. <clears throat> See, did I already read first, 2 Timothy 1.10? No, I didn't read that yet. 2 Timothy 1.10, there it is. But now is made manifest, that means to be shown, to appear, by the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ who has abolished death. For those that are saved... The former things are passed away, and the last enemy, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 26, is death. We will never die. Our bodies die, but the real essence of who we are will keep living, and we get a new body, a resurrected, glorified body. Former things, the things Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, talks about the things that are caused by sin. Sin has consequences, folks. I've seen people with syphilis and other venereal diseases, AIDS. Had a man come into my office one day. He was dying of AIDS. He said, I said, how'd you get AIDS? He said, from my male lover down in Houston. And I said, you know, I'll let you stay at the mission, but I don't feel sorry for you. He said, how come? I said, because you did this to yourself. And I asked him, I said, didn't you know that it was against God's plan for men to screw around with other men and women with women? He said, oh, I knew that I grew up in church. He said, I don't feel sorry for you. He died just a few weeks later. You know, I was reading Encyclopedia Britannica 1984, they had an article in there about how AIDS got started in this country with two homosexual men in San Francisco. A couple years later, because I got their book of the year every year, a couple years later, I always read, read through them. A couple years later, that wasn't in there. The homosexual community got all upset and they took it out. No more telling people where it came from. Jesus says, I make all things new. I am Alpha, verse 6, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the beginning and the last, the first and the last. I am God. He that overcomes, that's Jesus, shall inherit all things. He did. I will be his God and he will be my son, the second person of the Holy Trinity. But it's just one God, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Now listen carefully. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, and the word sorcery is the same word we get the word from the root word we get pharmaceuticals or drugs. Idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 
Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, that's people engaged in illicit sex who are not married to anybody, nor idolaters, people who worship idols, or adulterers, that's people that are committing adultery, but they're married to somebody else, just not to people they're committing adultery with. Oh, I wonder how that got in here. Nor effeminate, in case you don't know what that means, that means men that are trying to look like girls and act like girls. I've seen a bunch of them. I had a guy come in my office in Nacogdoches just a few months back, dressed like a woman, and he had pretty good legs. <laughs> I'm serious. He looked looked like a woman. I thought it was a woman. Hair was done up nice, had nice fingernails. I mean, it looked like a woman. Sounded like a woman. But as we talked, I knew something wasn't quite right. So I finally just said, you're not a woman, are you? He said, no. He said, I'm a, I'm a transvestite. I said, well, great. I said, look, he wanted to stay at the mission. I said, I'll let you stay at the mission. I said, but I'm going to tell you right now, you have to go into men's dorm and you're going to have to put up with a lot of ridicule and laughter and probably some of it's going to be coming from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the truth. I told him, I said, I'm, I preach on homosexuality pretty regularly. I'm not going to change just because you're here. And we've had a lot of homosexual people stay with our, in our missions over the years. And I always give them the same speech. And the ones that stay, we never have a problem. I don't put the two guys in the same room. <laughs> but we never really have a problem. I tell them, you know, I don't mind if that's what you want to do and that's what you think is right to do. Just don't do it here. Same thing applies to drinking. You want to drink? Fine. Do it somewhere else. Don't do it here. You want to smoke? Fine. Do it over there. We have rules nor abuses themselves with mankind, that's homosexuality, nor thieves, nor covetous, that's lust, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed. In other words, some people live in these lifestyles that are immoral, get saved, and they quit doing it. Like King David, who was known as a man after God's own heart. He committed adultery and had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, killed. But he repented of that sin and never did anything like that again. And God called him a man after his own heart. Not because he was perfect, but because he was willing to acknowledge his sin and repent. Well, the new Jerusalem's coming down from heaven. I'm not going to read about the foundations and all that again. You can read it for yourself. Just to say there are 12 gates, and they have the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. If you read the list in, earlier in the book of Revelations, and you read in the Old Testament, you'll find out there's one tribe different, and that's the tribe of Daniel. It's not there. It was replaced. God destroyed it. Dan. Huh? Dan. Dan. Not Dan. Dan, I'm sorry. And uh, had three gates on each side. All four sides. Twelve foundations were the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now you remember there was one apostle missing, Judas Iscariot, because he went out and hung himself after he turned in the Lord Jesus and found out he couldn't undo it. Well, the boys got together in Acts chapter 1 and threw some dice called a lot. And uh, they picked Matthias as the twelfth apostle, but that was not God's choice. Paul was the choice, and God met him on the road to Damascus. Paul was the only educated one of the bunch. The rest of them were all fishermen and people that were uneducated. Some of them never went to school at all. That's who God picked, and he still does the same thing today. In fact, I found after many years of studying that most of the people that I would think are brilliant people who have PhDs in theology and science and all kinds of things. Some of them write books and say the dumbest things you've ever heard that are just not right and don't square with the Bible. God picked dummies because they would listen. He said he picked the poor to be rich in faith. Rich people have a hard time getting into heaven. Jesus said so. 
and the rich people were the most educated back in this day. Well, he took out a golden reed to measure the city, and he measured it 12,000 furlongs in verse 16. That's 1,500 miles. So the new city, Jerusalem, is a cube. It looks like a board cube. And it's 1,500 miles that away, and 1,500 miles that away, and 1,500 miles that away. There's going to be plenty of room for all the dwelling places he's putting in there for us. Each one of us will have our own. I've asked God that he would put my wife on another floor from me, away from me. That's for her benefit. She wants to get away, I'm going to let her. There's no marriage in heaven. It's different relationships altogether. And uh, he measured the thickness of the walls, and it was 216 feet. That's 72 yards. That's a big place. Big place. And the housing will probably be in the walls because that's the way they used to build and that's the way it's going to be built. The foundations, all these precious stones and everything, I'm not going to read all that, but I want to tell you in verse 21 something that's very interesting to me. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each gate was one pearl. Can you just imagine the oyster? <laughs> <laughs> that'd be some big oyster that's a big oyster hey let's cook it and have dinner hey, we ain't got a pot that big how many people will this oyster feed about 600 that's a big oyster could God make big oysters sure he can sure that's no trick for God and I saw no temple because the Lord was the temple and the lamb was the temple that's Jesus, the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. And the city had no need of the sun, and the Lamb was the light thereof. Why? Because God is light. But look at this, very interesting. The nations of them that are saved, which is all there's going to be on the new he heaven and the new earth, is saved people. The rest of them, we already talked about last week, were cast into the lake of fire. Now folks, some people get upset and they say, I believe God's a loving God. He wouldn't send anybody to hell. Actually, there is some truth in that statement. God does not send people to hell. People send themselves there by not receiving Christ as their Lord and Savior, not trusting Jesus. They end up sending themselves there. It was never God's will for people to go to hell. When hell was even created, it was created for the devil and his angels, not for people. But if you're determined to go there, God will let you go there. That's what you want. A fellow asked me one day, he said, Brother June, you don't believe all that stuff about hell, do you? I said, yeah, I do. He said, do you even believe it's in the center of the earth like the Bible says? I said, yeah, I believe that. He said, well, it can't be in the center of the earth. I said, why not? He said, because it's hot there. <laughs> I said, duh. Duh. Yeah, I believe it's in the center of the earth, just like God said, and that it enlarges itself. Every time there's a new person come in for occupancy, hell enlarges itself to take in another person. And it can keep on enlarging and take in everybody, and billions of people are going to go there. Jesus said, those that go down the narrow path, which there will only be a few, will get to heaven. The people that end up in hell are going to go down a very wide path and there's going to be many. In fact, the best we can tell from trying to figure out, looking at the clues, there's about 100 million Christians over all of time that are going to be in heaven. And when you compare that to the billions of people that have been on earth, that's a pretty small number, small percentage. But Jesus was the one that said it. Few will find it. Many will end up in hell. And you can be one of those. All you got to do is trust Jesus. And we will know if you do because your works will tell us. You see, what you know shows. That's why I don't like to have too many conversations with very many people because what they know shows and they don't see it. You need to understand, we as a human race advertise what's in our heart. 
You see, what you love the most is what you'll talk about the most. If you love football more than anything like most Texans, that's what you'll talk about. If you love drugs, that's what you'll talk about. In fact, some people are so dumb, they talk about it on Facebook and end up in trouble. I never have understood that. I've never been on Facebook, never going to be on Facebook. I never even sent a text. Don't plan to. I'm old fashioned. People always tell me, Brother Gene, I'll text you. I said, no, you won't. Why not? I said, because I won't read it. You know what I do when I get a text on my phone? I hand it to my wife and I say, get this off my phone. I don't want to read it. If you want to talk to me, either come see me face to face or call me on the telephone at least. We'll talk. But I don't care about all that texting junk. Because when you can't see somebody's face, you're not really communicating. I could look at you on a text and say, I love you. And all the time sitting there behind the phone going, I Right? And you don't know what people are thinking, but when you look them face to face in the eyeball, it's a lot easier to tell what they're really saying. The gates shall not be shut. There's going to be commerce going on in this new earth. And they shall bring glory and honor of the nations, and there shall be no way that anything that defiles or makes an abomination. I keep telling the homosexuals, I, said, I don't hate you. I feel sorry for you because you're not going to get into heaven. Well, show me that in the Bible. So I show them in the Bible. Romans chapter 1. God says it's an abomination. Leviticus chapter 17. God says it's an abomination. You're not going to get into heaven. If you're determined to live that kind of a lifestyle, well, that's fine. I like to say it's a free country. Right now it is. It may not be much longer. <laughs> the only ones that are going to get into heaven are those that have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you're saved, your name was written there before the foundation of the world because God knows the end in the beginning. He dwells in nonlinear time. We dwell in linear time. God knows everything. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you're going to think in 15 minutes, even though you're not sure what you're going to think in 15 minutes. He knows what you do in the shower. He knows what you do at night. He knows what you do in the daytime. He knows everything. That's why it's a wise person who gets honest with God. You're not going to embarrass God. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, I don't think I can get saved because I'm such a big sinner. I said, tell God. Tell God. Just tell God. I said, tell him. Another guy told me one time, he says, I don't believe God exists. I said, tell him. Tell him. But I don't believe he exists. I said, tell God you don't believe he exists. People have done that for years and people keep coming away realizing there's a God. Talk to him. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't get embarrassed. Doesn't even matter about your language if it's crude. He knows all the words. He invented language. The thing that will get you in trouble with God is trying to hide, trying to be dishonest. Let me end with this thought. There was a couple, Josh McDowell had a couple of atheists come to him. They said, we don't believe that God exists. And uh, we don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You know, they went on and on and on. And so Josh McDowell challenged these guys. They were professors. He said, I want you to go and do some research about the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And we'll meet back here in six months and you tell me what you have found. See if you can disprove the resurrection of Christ in a court of law. We can't prove it scientifically, but you can't prove what you ate last week scientifically. But you can prove it in a court of law. And so these guys went off, each their own way, to disprove the resurrection of Christ. Six months later, they came back rather sheepishly because both of them had become Christians. Because there is more evidence for the resurrection of Christ 
in historical documents, not just in the Bible, but historians like Josephus and others. There's more evidence for that than what sends people to prison and to the gas chamber when they used to do that, and hangings when they used to do that, and electric chair when they used to do that. You can send somebody to prison with two or three witnesses. There were hundreds of witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. And people don't understand, and they come up with their own opinions and ideas. Your opinions are worthless. Mine are worthless. Why would you think that your opinion is better than what God says in this book that has stood the test of time? The New Testament is over 2,000 years old. The Old Testament dates back even farther than that, about 4,000 years old. It's been the same. Why would you want to take some word of some man who was born in 1947, who says God doesn't exist or something, or says you evolved from some kind of precursor to an ape? Why would you want to believe those people and not believe what God has to say? You know how many people have tried to prove this book wrong? Thousands. Scholarly people. They've never been able to do it. It's true. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is true. And that in itself is amazing. 66 books written by 40 some different authors over several thousand years. And it's an agreement with itself. There's no contradictions in God's word. There's only some things we don't understand yet. But we're working on those. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your word tonight. I thank you for each person in the room. I hope they're listening. And I hope they understand the word of God. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't want anybody to have a miserable life. But some of them are headed that way. At least if they get saved, they'll get into heaven. That's so much better than the alternative. And I've known people that have literally killed themselves with substance abuses of various kinds that were Christians. And I believe we'll see them in heaven, but they're also going to be of that bunch that's going to be embarrassed seeing Jesus because they missed opportunities. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your book. We pray for the wisdom that we need, which you promised to give us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.